Are we on? I guess we are. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. YouTubers and Facebookers, and good morning, uh, drive-in church people. Turn your mic on. Oh, how about put my mic on? Wait. Those who are outside are going to wonder what your mouth is doing. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. You didn't get the equipment on. It's just one of those mornings, you know? It's one of those mornings. Okay. Put on the equipment. Don't try this at home. We are professionals. So. My, oh my. We'll get going here pretty soon. Drummond Island time. So now, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. It's got that nice kind of divine kind of <laughs> godlike hello. <laughs> this is the Lord. So anyway, um, just the one announcement that comes to mind is if you want to participate with the these guys, the shoe boxes, uh, we have one week. So we'll be the official collection time is next Sunday. And uh, then we will be taking them over during the week to the collection site. Actually, uh, Pastor Kilponen will be doing that. Had a nice talk with Roger this week. So get these shoe boxes in. There's information on uh, Operation Christmas Child, I think, .org or Samaritan's First. Anyway, you can check it out on our website, lighthousechurchdrummondisland.com. You can check on the homepage there. There's information and links and all sorts of things. But we need to get them in in a week, so pack them up. We've got a whole bunch already, some really cool looking ones. And they go out to kids all over the world, and it's just amazing how happy they are. And they get Jesus, and they get toys, and, and all sorts of cool stuff. So November 15th, so please be praying for Operation Christmas Child as all this comes together. I mean, millions upon millions of shoeboxes are processed. It's an amazing thing to behold to watch some of these videos, and you can check that out also on uh, the internet. So let's get started. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this day, this amazing day that you have made. Thank you, Lord, for creating us for your purposes. And then when we walk in your purposes, we discover what it truly means to be happy, to truly know what a fulfilling life is all about. Thank you, Lord. Help us to change. Help us to be transformed in your precious name. Amen. Let's sing some songs. <coughs> The first song is an invitation to the Holy Spirit to be with us. Come, Holy Spirit. We've sung this one before. It goes something like this. Thank you. 
stand. Jump around, do some jumping jacks, push-ups. We got our workout yesterday, so those of you who are on the crew, you don't have to do any exercises. You won't be jumping. <laughs> you won't be jumping. Go something like this. for us, that place of solidarity with ourselves, with those around us, with all of the world. Clay, would you take the offering this morning? This final song, it's a simple song, but day and age, things seem so fragmented and anxious. And it goes something like this. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down
recaps of everything, all of our cares, our anxieties, our feelings of concern, our hopes and dreams. We cast all of that upon you, Lord, knowing that you can carry that with your grace and with your power. Teach us to walk beside you, Lord, in everything that we do. Teach us to know deep down inside that we're truly not alone and that we have a friend in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Today is a very special birthday, November 8th, 1918. Florence Chadwick was born, and you probably don't know the name, but Florence Chadwick was born on this day uh, 102 years ago. She's no longer with us on the earthly plane, but she is. Uh, she did leave her mark, and she has a story. When she was very, very young, she grew up in San Diego, California. When she was very, very young, she showed an aptitude for swimming. You know how some kids, you know, you throw them in the pool and they just swim like little fish. And uh, Florence was one of those little kids. She just could swim and she was fast. She was fast. Well, when she was very young, at the age of eight, her parents entered her into a, a swim meet and they thought, this kid can really go. She can really zip along. Well, she came in last. Well, Florence began to understand that she was a good swimmer, and she began to practice every day, every day, in and out. That was her focus. Everything was about swimming. She entered the same meet again, better, stronger, wiser. She lost again. She came in last place. Well, Florence... Uh, Proceeded on, she swam in uh, school and high school, joined clubs and things like that. I want to make sure that I get this right. At, she did swim, she swam in endurance uh, in San Diego Bay there. She swam in endurance uh, kind of swim. It was six miles, and she actually did pretty well in that. But it wasn't the speed racing that she had set her heart on. At the age of 18, she tried out for Olympic speed swimming, and she came in fourth. The problem was only three, the top three, were selected for the Olympics, and she missed out on that. She began to get discouraged, and, and she just couldn't quite get the speed that she wanted to. And so she gave up. She just gave up. As a young woman, she said, well, at least I can be successful as a, a wife and a, a mother. And so she got married. And that marriage tragically ended in divorce. She remarried another person with new hopes and dreams. That marriage, too, ended in divorce. And she never had any children. How do you handle disappointment? When life doesn't go your way, what do you do? I mean, we're all different. We all react differently. When we begin to see things as a vision and a future, and we have our heart set on those things, and then it all comes crashing down, what do you do? Well, there are some things in the Bible, and I love the Bible because it's so real. It's so real. It's about real people, a real God. It's about real life, and it doesn't pull any punches. And people in the Bible get disappointed, too. They think they're heading in one direction, and all of a sudden life explodes or implodes in on them. And they, have, they are left to deal with their own disappointment. And sometimes they turn to God, and they find a way through. Sometimes they turn in and on themselves and, and things become tragic and dark. How do you handle disappointment? What do you do? 
How do you react in those situations where you've got your heart set on something and it doesn't pan out? Take a look at four things that you can do, four biblical kinds of processes that you can do. And again, nothing in this realm or any kind of realm of any importance is simple. There are no simple answers. I've reduced it down to some things. They all start with one letter, the letter L. But, but to keep in mind that nothing is simple in the human realm or in life itself. And so we work at these things. But it's just to give you some pointers, some things that pop out of the Bible, particularly out of the Old Testament, but also centering in on Jesus and how he participates in our disappointment. Because he does. He doesn't just take off. He doesn't just leave us to kind of wallow in our own stuff. That's the beautiful thing about God, is he doesn't leave us alone. And that we don't have to live life alone. Even though we may feel lonely and go through periods of kind of disconnection and all this, the reality is, and this book says it over and over again, that no matter what we're going through, and no matter what our attitude is, good, bad, or indifferent, no matter where we are in that journey, God is a constant and faithful companion. That's good news. That's the good news. So we can draw upon that when we're able. You know, and we can kind of find that place of connection instead of disconnection, and we can begin to draw upon that. I talked about that a while back in prayer and finding that centering prayer place when life is kind of going crazy. Uh, we can center it on Christ and find that calm, that peaceful place, at least for a moment or two <laughs> before we launch into big life. But four things that we can take a look at biblically that might help us to be able to deal with disappointment and not just in a way that you know i'm going to make it through with our teeth clenched but to be able to walk in some sort of peace and joy um, some sort of semblance of life and be able to communicate that to others so again it's something that we work at it's a practice you could call it a, a spiritual or emotional discipline but it's something that we take day by day, moment by moment. So let's take a look at the first one. The first L, when we experience disappointment, the first L is, it's a biblical word, it's lament. And I've talked about this in some other sermon contexts. And lament is different than other kinds of responses. Lament is basically crying out. We, we realize that we have a broken heart. Things have been broken, that we've lost something very precious. It may not be tangible, but we've lost something, a vision, a hope, a future. Whatever we were imagining was going to happen, we've lost it, and there's grief work there. And instead of converting that deep sadness into anger or trying to strike out or somebody's got to pay for this, you know, vengeance, uh, which, yeah, I, I, I was into that for a little bit. You know, I would get angry and you'd look for somebody to blame or something to blame, whether God or human or something, and uh, began to realize that this book gives a better way. And it, it doesn't necessarily seem better. It seems like we want to get angry and we want to strike out and, and destroy something or do something. Because, but to be able to stay in the primary emotion of sadness or a broken heart, to be able to stay there, just like Mary did, Jesus' mother, or, or other people who were able to hold that brokenness inside. Now, it takes some trust, obviously, to do that, but to hold that brokenness inside and actually experience that, that's lament. And it's a crying out, just a crying out. It's a raw kind of, ah, crying out to God and, and letting that emotion ride, letting it happen. Again, trusting that God is with us. He's guiding the process. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, and that we're not alone in this just to struggle and, and try to tread water all on our own. Lament 
allows us, when we experience that and we don't try to just fix stuff, because that's the tendency, or destroy stuff, or hurt people, or hurt ourselves, or something like that, what lament does is it helps us to experience life as it really is. Because our problem is, and this is where we get into most of our anxiety and problems, are those broken expectations and we keep pressing in on, well, it's got to be this way. It's got to happen this way. And we manipulate and we, we cajole and, and we, we coerce life to try to make it fit into our box. And we all do it. I mean, that's part of being human. That's what... But any, any human story is that we struggle against that. Lament sets us up to simply experience life as it really is. And we feel brokenhearted on things, or we feel rejoicing on things, or happy, or sad, or whatever it is, but it's experiencing life as it really is. And we begin to open ourselves to wonderful things like truth, <laughs> and, and God, and allowing us to be grounded in what truly is happening in our lives. But it opens us up and it grounds us for something very important. Oftentimes what you'll see when you read the Old Testament or the New Testament, but to, particularly uh, in the stories of the Old Testament, it, it's the, the Hebrew people are met with some sort of um, thing that's going to happen. And what they do immediately, they cry out and they go to sackcloth and ashes. They take off their nice clothes and they go to sackcloth, like burlap bag kind of stuff, and, and they put ashes on their head, and, and they think, wow, that's a little dramatic. But what it signifies is, is that we're dust, and, and to dust we shall return, that, that there's, it's an exercise in humility. But that humility grounds us in an interesting sort of way. And to cry out and to do the sackcloth. I mean, you don't have to physically do that, but that's what they did. And it was a physical manifestation. And it, again, it wasn't trying to fix stuff. It wasn't trying to, because that's what we tend to do, you know, fix things. And there's nothing wrong with fixing things at the right time. But there, there is a time when we love, when there's not really anything that you can do and how many situations are like that uh, and to be able to cry out and to cry out to God and say oh God I, I can't I'm powerless I, I can't do it I have no ideas uh, how do we get out of this thing and God meets us in that place of reality and he extends his hand which brings us to the next part, to loosen. And I, this is my version of a hand. It's an open hand. <laughs> Use your imagination. Work with me, people. Uh, so anyway, it's an open hand. Loosen your grip. And, and that's what happens with this whole lament thing. And it, it starts you on that sequence or starts you on a journey of dealing with this disappointment in a healthy way in a healthy way. You're not trying to run away or change sadness or pain, emotional pain, into anger or vengeance or other things. You're just simply sitting with that lament. You sit with it, and then you begin to loosen your grip. Well, it's mostly on the expectations that you have. You begin to realize, yeah, I guess this isn't going to happen. <laughs> and you begin to to loosen your grip on expectations, but also other things around you. There's a, a proverb, Proverbs 19, 21, says, many plans are in a person's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. Many plans are in somebody's heart, a human heart. But it's the counsels of the Lord that will stand. In fact, the Hebrew word actually means, it's a more active word, it means to rise up. We have lots of plans, we have lots of expectations.
but it's God's counsel that rises up, that is active and alive. And that's what we want to follow, or at least try to get in touch with. Well, what's, what's your plan, God? What, what are you doing in this? Then Proverbs, Proverbs is so great. Proverbs 16, verse 3, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. And there are other places where the Bible talks about that, where we, we kind of get frustrated and we go, I guess my plans aren't working. And we throw in the towel and we think it's defeat, but God sees it as a beginning. <laughs> and, and we say, okay, God, you take it from here. I'm obviously incompetent here. And, and God takes it. He goes, all right, here we go. And we begin to see a plan or a vision or a future, a project, something that God establishes. That we don't, he sets it up. He, he gives us the power, the wisdom, the smarts, everything to accomplish that project. And it goes, I mean, there may be little hitches here and there, but the basic thing goes really well. It's very smooth. And we go, wow, that's quite an experience. And God just smiles, you know. Maybe we can do it again sometime. <laughs> so we commit our plans to him. Of course, and then there's that wonderful Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, give you a future. To be good to you. That's my plan for you. And we don't trust that. We think God's this mean guy, you know, who's trying to hit us with a stick or something or a lightning bolt. But God is so loving. I mean, his very nature is love. And so he's just always pouring himself out for us. But he has a plan. There's a plan for us. And we may not see it. We may be bumping into walls and getting bruised and everything else. But God has a plan for us. Not just long range, but day to day, breath by breath, moment by moment. And for us to walk in that plan, Paul called it walking in the spirit. For us to walk in that plan... That's your source of happiness, because that's when you're connected in. That's when you're plugged in to the, the electricity of God's presence, his, his life. And so loosening our potential in all of this. The next one is to look, to look, to look at the bigger picture. Because once you've loosened your grip when, on the echo expectation thing, once you, you're, you're committing yourself to truth and actually experiencing life as it really is, once you're al allowing God to open up your vision, you can look at the bigger picture. You can see the bigger picture. There's a wonderful psalm. I think it's, it's Psalm 1833, where setting him like like a deer uh, on a, a high place. It's like overlooking the valley, seeing the bigger picture of things. And once you begin to see the bigger picture, that's where things begin to connect. You go, oh yeah, okay. And the whole disappointment thing kind of moves off a little bit to the sidelines and you begin to see, oh, here's what's really going on. And it's a picture of hope. It's a picture that Okay, and, and what happens is, I mean, we have our face so close to the wall. We, that's all the wall. There it is. It's all wall. There's no way over. All I see is wall. And God says, well, back up a few steps. Here, climb up these steps. Here, get a bigger, bigger view. And we begin to see doors and passageways and places where we can walk through that we never saw before because we've seen the bigger picture. to walk through the door <laughs> into a new place. And that's not easy. Paul is an interesting study in some of this of seeing the bigger picture and how he dealt with disappointment. Now, Paul was human. You know, he's an apostle and wrote half the New Testament. But he's still human. And he dealt with a lot of emotions, particularly in the area, and this is in a number of his letters in the New Testament, Paul will talk about these false apostles, these people who had some spiritual uh, intelligence to them, 
but they would do it for the wrong reasons, or they go off on these tangents, or, or they fail to maintain that kind of Holy Spirit balance. And Paul would grieve over that. And, oh, and he had some words for them at times, uh, these false apostles. And he would struggle with this. Uh, and you can see it with some of the other letters, too, in John and um, Christ and things like that. There's some strong language. So, I mean, it wasn't all hunky-dory in the original church. You know, let's just go back to the original church. No, don't want to go there. Um, there's all sorts of divisions and schisms and stuff going on and infighting. So we don't want to go back there, but we can learn from them. And one particular place that popped out to me was Philippians, one of Paul's letters, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 13. Philippians chapter 1, if you have your Bibles with you, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. And keeping in mind that Paul is in jail, he's in prison. <laughs> And so he's not in a real happy place. And he talks about some of these people who are doing stuff kind of for ego purposes and not just for the gospel. Letter to the Philippians, very first chapter, starting at the 12th verse. And Paul says, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Keep in mind, he's in prison, he's in jail. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. Like everybody in the prison knows why he's there. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Now some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So what then? Only that in every way, listen to this, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectations and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ, even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul was seeing the bigger view. He goes, people are all tied up in their own selfish stuff and all this, but they're proclaiming Christ. At least some good is happening in all of this. And there was a deep, deep trust in the goodness of God that God's goodness, no matter what's happening with human hearts, God's goodness is unstoppable. Our calling is to understand even in the midst of disappointment, there will be a victory. That God's goodness is unstoppable relentless, just like his love, just like everything else with God, that God is moving all of history in a good direction. And there'll be skirmishes and all sorts of things that will happen. There'll be lost hopes and dreams. There'll be broken hearts. But God's goodness and his plans, the good plans that he has for you, are unstoppable. And you can fight against it if you want to, if that's what you feel like doing, go ahead, try that out. Or you can try to move with that. And it's about. Which brings me to the last thing here. You've got lament, loosen your grip, look at the bigger picture, and then you have lean, lean on friends 
who help you to focus on all the other stuff. Not friends that will just pat you on the back. I mean, those, I suppose those are good too. <laughs> Once in a while, pat you on the back, say, ah, oh, you're great, you know, you're, you're fantastic, um, and then move on. But friends, friends who love you enough to kind of gently, lovingly refocus you, maybe by asking a question, how are you doing? Maybe by listening to you and your broken heart and, and your struggle with loosening your grip and all of this. Friends who are there for you, but will try to help to encourage you to be focused and to move, keep moving forward. Friends you need. Disappointment. And I think about, you know, stories in the Bible and just when Esther... In the book of Esther, she's, she's faced with the destruction, the total destruction of, of the Jews and herself. She's faced with her own death and, and the death of people that she loves and, and, and hundreds of thousands of others, too, in this foreign kingdom. And she listens to her uncle, who encourages her. And Uncle Mordecai is realistic. He says, you may lose your life in all of this. But God will raise up some, some other way of deliverance for his people. But it may be catastrophic for you and maybe for others. But God will find the words. He says, and perhaps for such a time as this, you were raised up for this moment. And Esther, you know, I wish I could have been there. Esther realizes that she's in the hand of God. She's in the hand of God. And that it's not dictated by all these in the hand of God. And she goes on to save a nation. I think about Aaron and her uh, holding up Moses' arms in their battle against, I think it was the Midianites they, in their journeys, their exodus across the lands, you know, reaching, going for the promised land. And, and there's that one battle where if, if, for whatever reason, Moses holds his staff up, they, they were winning the battle, but when his arm got tired, then they start losing the battle, holds up the staff, they win, lose, win, lose. And, and then Moses, has two good trusted friends who hold his arms up so that the Israelites win the battle. Friendship. People who are there for you, who will sacrifice. I mean, their, their arms got tired too, you know? But it was three instead of one. I think about the friends who had, had that guy who, who couldn't walk and he was, he was lame and and they really wanted to get in to see Jesus, right? You know, and Jesus is healing people right and left. But he's in a crowded room. He's in a house. And there's everybody's in there. It's just all crowded. And, and nobody's socially distancing or anything. And, and, then, and then they're all in there. And, and, and they go, how are we going to bring our friend in there? How do we do this? And because they're friends, they are think, 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 think. Let's think of a creative way outside the box to help our friend. And they take the guy up on the roof and they start tearing away this guy's roof. You know, God bless him, you know. But they, they tear a hole in the roof. They lower him down because friends find a way to help their friends when they're in trouble. Lean on friends who will help you Go through that passageway, through that disappointment, and come out stronger on the other side. Find those friends. Those are the ones who are important. And in all of this, you know, in each one of these different processes, that he's, he's there for you, and he will draw you in. He will draw you in. Remember Francis Chadwick, who was so disappointed, life just was falling apart before her very eyes, divorced twice. 
She's not the speed swimmer she thought she was. At the age of 31, she started rethinking her life. It's a good thing. She starts rethinking her life. And she thinks about all the times where in those endurance swims, she was actually pretty good. She thought, maybe it's not speed swimming that it's all about. Let's give this endurance thing a try. So, at the age of 31, she trains, and with the encouragement of her mother, her best friend, she sets out to swing, swim the English Channel. The English Channel. <laughs> and she swims it from England to France. She swims it in record time. In fact, she had been held for 24 years. And she swims that channel. Good enough. The next year, she swims it the other way, and she becomes the to swim the English Channel both ways. A year after that, she's out of okay, and she's in familiar territory, except she's uh, San Diego, Catalina Island. It's an little island off of uh, the coast of Los Angeles. I remember it fondly from Boy Scout camp days. We had a Boy Scout camp on Catalina Island. But it took forever. We had these water taxis that would take us out there. It's quite a few miles. She said, I'm going to swim from Long wherever it was, Long Beach. Or I'm going to swim. No, actually, she started. She said, I'm going to swim to the coast. And so. She starts the swim, and after about 15 hours in the water, there are boats all around her, because they're looking for what? Sharks, right? What a great swim. They're looking for sharks and other kinds of things out there, and her mother is in one of the boats, encouraging her, urging her on. And after about 15 hours, she feels like a piece of lead, a piece of lead. And and she just, she can't go on. And what makes it worse is this, the California fog comes in and she can't even see the land. She can't even see which, and they have compasses, but she can't physically see the land. And she, she's discouraged. She cannot see, see where she's going. And she gives up. She gives up. Totally. Two months later, she tries it again. And the same thing happens. At about 15 hours, she feels like lead. The fog comes in. She can't see. But she does something different this time. The way she described it, she said, in my imagination, I visualized the coastline, and I swam for that, and she made it. In fact, she went on to swim the thing two more times. In fact, Florence Chadwick, she was inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 1970. She was a success. She overcame her disappointment. And part of that is just perseverance, is to press through. But I encourage you to press through with some of these things in mind, not just the dogged kind of persistence that's blind and you're just kind of, kind of charged. Thoughtfully, mindfully, and especially in a participation with what the Holy Spirit is trying to do with your life. And those places where your dreams and your visions have failed, where things have crumbled literally in front of you, do what Francis Chadwick did. Imagine. Allow the Holy Spirit to stir your imagination just a little bit and imagine a future. And instead of going, oh, well, that's not possible, Loosen your grip, 
open to the larger picture and allow the Holy Spirit to begin to formulate a new future for you or a new pathway for you or a new of where you might be in the next breath or the next week or the next year. Allow the Holy Spirit to work with you just like Francis Chadwick. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you never, ever leave us or forsake us. And we thank you, Lord, that you are there to guide us with your hand. Teach us, Lord, how to take your hand, how to be sensitive and aware of your presence of love and truth and guidance in our lives. Help us, Lord, to know you better and to walk with you discovering who we truly are as we walk this life's journey. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So, Facebook, uh, we'll have another topic next week. Uh, don't forget to check out our website at lighthousechurchdrumandisland.com and uh, Look at the donate tab. We we appreciate your donations very much. So and prayer support. Uh, also, when you on this on Facebook or YouTube, please remember to share this video with somebody who is feeling discouraged or disappointed. Uh, let's spread this around that we can be victorious in this life, even through brokenness and pain. So share this video with others. Uh, like and subscribe and do all those other good things. We appreciate